Thank you very much, Eric. I would like very much to thank the organizers. And it was very nice also to, to hear from uh, Hamza about uh, uh, Mark of Change because it's a nice segue. So I'm going to be talking about uh, a subject which is classical, uh, but yet not so widely known. Uh, Hamza under the name Schrodinger Bridges. And it's, it's perhaps the, the first instance of a large deviations question. So this is a joint work with Michele Pavon from the University of Padova. Um, the, 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 work, the presentation is based on a, a joint paper, which is uh, positive contraction matrix for classical and quantum short systems. Uh, it relates to a well-known theorem uh, in, in statistics, the Synchron theorem. And there is some discussion in Wikipedia, which uh, I, I help write. And um, some of the synchron, um, the relevance of the synchron I'll be talking later on, the quantum version, uh, it's in our paper and also independently discovered by Gurditz a little bit earlier, our proof is uh, much simpler, almost trivial. So I'm going to discuss a little bit the background to set the stage and to explain the, um, the, the potential significance of that. At the very end, I'll, I'll discuss some questions, some, some conjecture, which uh, underlies the fact that we have not gotten to the bottom of it. I think there is some very interesting direction, directions, possibly impactful, um, um, and, and I'll, uh, I will invite, I mean, any uh, feedback on this. So first I would like to discuss, uh, give a brief, brief history of the Schrodinger bridges, transition to Markov chains. Uh, then uh, I'll yeah. talk about the Hilbert metric. It's also a classic, uh, classical uh, concept that is extremely helpful, but again, not so widely known. And then um, introduce bridges for a quantum, in a quantum setting. So, so just briefly, historically, the subject starts in 1931-32. Uh, Erwin Schrodinger uh, had a Gedanken experiment of a, a diffusion that is, is constrained at the two ends of the, at the beginning and an end of a time interval. And he was concerned about uh, a, a classical interpretation of Schrodinger's equation. Uh, it's quite interesting, and th this is beautiful work. I don't have time to talk about this, but the title of his talk is The Time Reversal of uh, Laws of Nature. Kolmogorov followed up with a very similar title. The, the story is very long, very interesting, and it relates to Nelson's stochastic mechanics, and there are many contributions, which I don't have the time right now to discuss. So. Um, the, very briefly, what is the Gedanken experiment? He thought of a large number of Brownian particles that are supposed to diffuse all over the place, uh, starting from some initial distribution, but then they are constrained to um, abide by an observed um, uh, empirical distribution at the end of the interval. Uh, and he, was, he asked the question, what is the most likely intermediate distribution at any point in time? So you wanted to, to find, so schematically, you have, let's say, some, some distribution of the particles at the beginning. You expect that something will happen at the end. That's the, the, what you expect to be the most likely the, as empirical, but you observe something different. And then you would like to find a law uh, on the, uh, the path of the, the particles. And that's what's referred to as the bridge. Basically, you want to change the measure in some way that abides by the prior. So you like one that's closest to the prior in the relative entropy sense that matches the two boundary points. The bridge is the law that matches the, the marginals. So uh, now I'm going to explain this in, in, uh, in the context of Markov chains. Very interestingly, Schrodinger back then by, by discretizing time and space, theorems some approximations, he came up with the correct solution. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about the history after. So in the context of Markov chains, let's say you have um, n state Markov chain, and you're looking at a path across time from beginning to t to, to final time t. You have transition probabilities. And then you're given two marginals. You're marginal at the beginning, marginal at the end. And you uh, observe that the marginal at the end is not consistent with the law that was given to you. So in other words, if you have the transition uh, from beginning to end, uh, uh, and then uh, you um, bring into account the initial distribution, they don't match. So the problem amounts to finding a new law. 
uh, star here means uh, optimal, which uh, abides by the two marginals uh, and uh, minimizes the relative entropy, the relative entropy to the prior law on the path space. So when you uh, disintegrate the measure, so you have the law on the path space, you condition it on the, 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 the pin points at the beginning and the end, and you write down the, the, um, the relative entropy. Uh, you see here a term which uh, can be, this is the law for the pinned bridges. And this, if agrees with the prior, this whole term disappears, becomes zero. So the problem uh, simplifies to consider the transition from beginning to the X. So, so the problem reduces to <clears throat> um, you're given uh, a prior uh, joint distribution between the beginning and the end. Uh, and you want a new one, which matches the, the two marginals and minimize the relative entropy. So that's uh, relatively simple with, uh, you know, when we have this understanding, this understanding took a long time to, to, to come about because you just write the, the Lagrangian and effectively that's what Schrodinger did uh, in his own ways. You write the Lagrangian and then you have uh, some Lagrange multipliers. These, uh, uh, the, the terminology here phi phi hat goes back to Schrodinger um, and uh, in, in a continuous time setting, these are harmonic and co-harmonic co functions. So, and, and when you solve the problem, the, the new uh, joint distribution uh, between the states at the beginning and at the end of the interval is basically the prior uh, scaled by these multiplicative factors to the left and right. So, so this is what's called diagonal scaling, because if you think of this as a matrix, then basically you multiply with a diagonal on the left and diagonal on the right that is formed out of the vector of uh, phi and phi hat. Um, and the transition probability, the, the, the corrected one is again some diagonal scaling to the left and right. So uh, if we were to write this in, in a matrix form, you have, let's say the transition probabilities as a matrix. And I use notation as a column stochastic matrix because I think of the phi and the phi hat vectors of Lagrange multipliers as column vectors. So uh, the conditions become uh, this uh, set of four equations. It's known as a Schrodinger system. So in order to solve the problem, you need to find vectors phi phi hat that relate as follows. Uh, the transition probability times phi zero hat gives you phi at the end. Uh, this is some adjoint uh, uh, expression. And then the marginals that you're given uh, is the entry wise product of the two uh, vectors. So the, you think of these column vectors and you multiply entry-wise uh, uh, the two vectors. We're coming, we'll come back to this when we, we, we get to the quantum setting. We, again, you're going to have in the quantum setting, you have a product of two Hermitian matrices that somehow the product has to be such that the product is a non-commutative product and you get a, a Hermitian matrix. So if, if you have a solution to the Schrodinger problem, then the, the, the uh, Schrodinger system, the solution to the problem is like that, which I wrote in the previous uh, slide in different ways. So uh, the, uh, this uh, new transition probability represents some sort of a, a change of measure on the path space, on the transition of the, uh, the Markov chain. So very briefly, Schrodinger didn't have a proof of this, but he said the solution exists except for some nasty uh, marginals because the solution, the, it's so natural and it makes sense. It took a long time for uh, the theory to be uh, completed and for the problem to be understood in this modern uh, way as a uh, large deviations problem. And this uh, a very simple way to solve the problem is uh, what is also encountered in statistics as called iterative scaling. If you start with the, the 
the transition probabilities here, and you observe that the uh, marginal is not equal to p times p pi times p zero, then you replace pi by uh, a, a diagonally scaled version of it. You just multiply the left with a diagonal, with this diagonal, so that you restore equality. So you, if you don't have equality here, you restore equality by scaling. But then, of course, you destroy the uh, the the the, uh, the column stochasticity of the matrix. So then you uh, multiply on the right now with a diagonal to restore this, and you proceed. This is called iterative scaling, and it it was shown that it's converging. Um, there is a long history on this, and uh, we're going to see basically a very simple proof of that. And the simple proof relates to a, a beautiful construct, which again goes even before Hilbert, but it's known as Hilbert metric. It has to do with, with uh, matrix uh, in convex sets. Uh, in this setting here, you have K, a closed convex cone in a real Banach space. It's a beautiful tool. If you have a convex cone, uh, you, this defines a partial order. So, um, the partial order allows you to compute a maximum and a minimum between uh, two entries. This is the scaling that uh, retains this order, and we call it this capital M, this lower M. And the Hilbert metric, which is a projective metric on the cone, is the logarithm of the ratio. Uh, there are two very interesting examples when the, the cone the positive cone is the positive quadrant in Rn, and this is the context of Markov chains. And uh, the other example is positive definite Hermitian matrices, which connects us with, with quantum. So um, then having that in place, we can define the gain of a map. The gain of the map is the least amplification uh, so the the, uh, the least amplification distance. So if you apply the map to two entries x and y, you want to see how it contracts. So it's like the contractive contraction ratio. Now a beautiful result, uh, and I have here a very special version of this for linear maps of Berkhoff and Bushel, is that if you have a map which is positive and monotone, and if it's linear then it is automatically contracting. Moreover, if the diameter of, um, of the, the image of the map, so if you take here, if you take elements in the cone, in the positive cone, and you look at the distance between them, this is the diameter of the set. If the diameter is finite, then the map pi is strictly contracting. So this, possible, this bound here uh, can, can be used effectively to, to have strict contractivity and, and then convergence of iterations. So the solution of the Schrodinger problem now becomes trivial, provided you can uh, ensure that uh, the, the transition probabilities, the matrix of transition probabilities is strictly contracting. And for that, you need a little bit of a strong assumption. For example, if you have that this is element-wise positive stochastic matrix, it's a sufficient condition. It's not necessary, There's, you, can, you can relax it a bit. So that's what I mean by element-wise positive. Then this implies that the diameter of the uh, image is finite and, co and strict contractiveness. So now let's go back to the Schrodinger system. So the Schrodinger system requires that a certain set of equations have a fixed point, and you can write it in this circular way you can start from a phi zero hat, some any vector. You map across, you get a phi uh, hat t. Then uh, you go down and you compute a phi so that a certain uh, condition holds. This condition over here says that the marginal pt is equal to the product of phi hat phi. But this is element entry-wise product. Then you come across with the adjoint equation and you go up again by again similarly ensuring this nonlinear condition at the other end for the, for the initial marginal. 
So the key is to, you know, the, those maps over here are contracting uh, under suitable conditions uh, in the cone of positive vectors. And the question is what happens with this nonlinear map, which basically takes phi zero and divides it. So it's a division kind of operator at the beginning here should have a zero. So, so, so then the, basically the, the, uh, this iteration here going along the loop has a fixed point, has a fixed point if this is contracting uh, the, because the key here is that this, this, uh, this map over here turns out to be an isometry. Division inverted inversion with, um, in, in the Hilbert metric is an isometry. The composition is strictly contractive. And then we have a fixed point, a solution to the Schrodinger system. Now, uh, the, synchronous, the celebrated synchronous theorem is a special case where you have, um, you have um, uniform marginals. And, and it was not, it was discovered much later than Schrodinger, but in parallel in statistics. So let's now move to the, the quantum counterpart. So here we're going to be dealing with density matrices, uh, trace one. We have a totally poor trace preserving maps. And the expression is here, you have um, the Krauss representation. And, and over here is the, the number of, uh, of uh, coefficients. And uh, we have to assume uh, a stronger condition, which is a positivity improving condition. So in other words, in, in a non-negative density becomes strictly positive. Now we, we perceive a very similar setting where you have a, um, a quantum evolution and uh, you have a composition of Krauss maps from some initial density to a final density. And the analog of the Schrodinger problem would be that you have, you, you, you don't have the rho t is not the same as E zero t uh, times rho zero. So the marginals don't match with the prior you, you're given. So we postulate the situation where you're looking a new uh, transition probabilities here, quantum probabilities so that they match and it's close to epsilon in some sense. Now we don't know what clause means here because we don't have any notion of, of entropy for the channel. But we, we postulate that you have um, a local correction, local transformations, local transformations. These are also Krauss map, but they have only one coefficient. This corresponds to the commutative case by just simply exactly the scaling that we saw earlier. Now we are going to see that uh, the, the, the commutative, the non-commutative multiplication would require that the phi is factored. So we're going to have the square roots and it really doesn't matter whether the, the Hermitian square roots or not. So the quantum version of Schrodinger's uh, synchronous problem would be that you're given a positive improving, improving map. Uh, and this is a theorem There exists a, 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 a Hermitian matrices positive, so that if you factor them, and you can factor them in fact any way you want, so this could be Hermitian square roots, this new map, which represents to a scaling at the start and a scaling at the end, it's doubly stochastic Krauss map and matches the, the uniform marginals and the two ends, the, the, um, the forward and the adjoint. And the proof is very, virtually identical. You start with a Hermitian matrix, you map across, then uh, the matching of the, the marginals, phi uh, times phi hat equal to the identity pre pre presents no difficulty because the way we write it is we have phi hat and then phi, uh, sorry, square root here and times the square root. So this is the notion of the non-commutative multiplication between Hermitians and it's just simply because the marginal's identity uh, is invertibility and this can be shown to be um, uh, an isometry in the Hilbert metric. Now the general case can be written down exactly the same. Then, then you require to have some sort of a non-commutative multiplication that get, gets the fine phi hat equal to rho zero and the same thing at the other end. So if, if you have a solution to the Schrodinger system, you can show that this is as we, we postulated that you have uh, local transformations, 
and match the marginals. The problem is we don't have a proof of convergence. Uh, if you have, this is a special case of a pin bridge that if the marginals are, are rank one, you can show that this is possible. So in other words, you can have a correction of this type that matches the marginals. Now, for the general case, we don't have a proof that the Schrodinger system converges. In the snag in our early proof is that the division becomes very complicated due to non-commutativity and they're not, no longer isometries. However, numerical evidence suggests co that convergence, ex extensive uh, um, experimentation shows that the system always converges. And in fact, which is very, very interesting, it converges if you have uh, different types of non-commutative multiplications at the two ends, which of course it, it requires different interpretation. So just to recap, because I'm running off out of time, I think, uh, the Hilbert metric gives you constructive proofs of existence for the classical Schrodinger systems and some versions of the quantum uh, Schrodinger system, which relates to a quantum version of a synchronous problem when you have uniform marginals. The general case is, is quite open. Uh, this suggests some sort of a notion of, um, of uh, change of measure. There are a big question issues of um, if, even if there is a solution to such a system always, does it minimize a certain functional? Uh, here we're a little bit um, um, basically out of our depths because it would require some sort of a, a, a joint entropy at the two ends of the channel. And I'm open to suggestions. And uh, again, many of you in the audience may know more about other tools that may come to, to, to assistance here. So with that, I would like to, to end my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.